My first question, Mr. Gunser, will be: Once you said that many of your colleagues didn't believe you that NATO had ever had a secret army. However, in 1990, Italy's Prime Minister Giulio Andreotti confirmed that there had been NATO secret armies in all NATO's member countries, and that in Italy such an army was called Gladio. In spite of these facts, many treated your book and the very fact of some secret armies with distrust. What other facts did you rely on? What ever Evidence of these NATO divisions? Did you find, for example, in Turkey or Switzerland?、Um, it is true that at the time when I was researching the subject NATO secret armies, many of my colleagues said they were not sure whether NATO had had secret armies at all during the Cold War. But when I looked at the data available, I found very clearly that NATO had secret armies during the Cold War that they were called Stay Behind, and I basically relied upon testimony. By Italian Prime Minister Giulio Andreotti at the time, but also investigations by the Italian Senate. I also relied on documents from the Italian Defense Department. Furthermore, I relied on、uh, parliamentary reports of the Belgium Senate. I relied on parliamentary reports of. The Swiss Parliament. So there is really a lot of evidence.、Uh, also, former CIA people who have spoken out. They all confirm that NATO had、uh, operated secret armies, which in Italy were called Gladio. In other countries, they had other names. So, Mr. Gonza, you started working on these issues some time ago. You have been working on the book called NATO's Secret Armies for a long period of time. Can you tell us actually what did you find out that you decided to start an investigation? What facts? Led you to the subject.、Um, it is true that I have worked on on the subject of NATO secret armies for more than ten years now, and、uh, my book was first published in two thousand and five. Let me see. I think it has come. It's now published in ten languages, but the first、uh, edition, the English edition, was published in two thousand and five. And the reason why I wanted to to、uh, shed more light、uh, on on NATO secret armies was really the question、uh, whether NATO is a force for peace or whether it is、um, some sort of a dark organization linked to terrorism and secret armies. And that was a very very difficult topic to investigate because NATO does not. Want to talk about its secret armies, despite the fact that it's proven that NATO was running secret armies in the Cold War. So、um, you have to understand that most people in the 28 NATO countries today do not know that NATO operated secret armies because NATO does not want to talk about it. You write that secret armies were formed in Western Europe in the early 50s of the last century to resist the Soviet invasion. Today, the leaders of Russia and the West. Point out that the Cold War has been ended. Do you really think that this, this is that is really so in practice? Are these statements confirmed?、Um, it is clear that the secret armies were formed after World War Two because、um, if I look for、uh, at the data from the secret armies in Norway, for instance, the Norwegian experience was in World War Two that they were occupied very quickly by the German army. So、um, they were scared that if in the Cold War there should be another invasion and occupation of their country, they feared a Soviet invasion of Norway, and many countries in Western Europe feared a Soviet invasion. They said we need a secret army which then would fight Soviet occupying forces in Western Europe. So this really was、um, the structure of the secret armies during the Cold War, and we have many documents that confirm the structures. There were secret Uh, arms caches in the grounds with guns and explosives and munitions, and it is clear that the secret armies existed during the Cold War, thus from 1950 to 1990, and then in 1990、uh, the Cold War ended, the, war, the Berlin Wall crumbled, the USSR、um, uh, was transformed into into Russia today. So it's the huge changes that、um, swept across. Europe influenced the secret armies in the sense that、um, the government said we now dissolve the secret armies. But I've been asked many times whether it is not possible 
that new secret armies have been set up by NATO, and I have to say, yes, that is possible. I think they would probably be under different names and different uh, forms, but it is possible um, that new secret armies uh, exist. The importance today, I think, is to talk about secret warfare in general. Mr. Gansa, according to your information, these divisions received money from the CIA and partly from the MI6. Washington or London will hardly ever confirm this fact. Nevertheless, can some evidence of the leading role of the US and the UK in coordination of these divisions and of the connection of the CIA with terrorism in Europe can be obtained? There are two aspects to your question. One thing is um, whether the CIA and the MI6, thus the American and the British Secret Service, whether they paid money to the secret armies of NATO, and that is confirmed. We do have very clear data from different sources. We also have um, uh, the former director of the CIA, William Colby, who in his memoirs uh, wrote how uh, the CIA funded the Stay Behind Armies. Therefore, this is very clear and confirmed. But the uh, and, and the same thing is confirmed for MI6. Uh, we know that the British uh, Secret Service, for instance, trained the Swiss Stay Behind Network, which was called P26. But we do not know whether the uh, CIA and the MI6, whether they were linked to acts of terrorism. We um, have many different voices here in Western Europe that say that NATO's secret armies, and especially Gladio in Italy, was linked to acts of terrorism, but I've said many times that it is very difficult to prove this uh, because there is no written document where the CIA says, please carry out an act of terrorism in Western Europe in order to scare the population. The idea really was that these acts of terrorism, which indeed were carried out in Italy and in Belgium and in other countries, that they were then blamed on the communists. Uh, in order to weaken the communist political parties in the parliaments of Western Europe. One of the aims of NATO's secret divisions was an influence on the political system of individual countries and a change of political course of one or another country. So, does it mean that terrorism, which is a forceful intervention, was considered as the main tool of political conviction? Again, that is this very delicate terrorism question. What I do know is that we had acts of terrorism uh, in Italy, for instance, in Piazza Fontana in, in 1969, or in Bologna in 1980, or in Germany in 1980, was a large attack, terrorist attack in Munich. Uh, in Belgium in the 1980s, there were large terrorist attacks or in France there were terrorist attacks uh, during the crisis with Algeria and we had military coup d'etats in Turkey, three military coup d'etats and we had a military coup d'etat in Greece and uh, Spain was a dictatorship during the Cold War and Portugal was a dictatorship during the Cold War. So the whole idea that there was no violence in Western Europe during the Cold War is simply wrong. There was a lot of violence and, and, and what we try to find out uh, now is uh, whether the secret armies uh, of NATO were linked to these acts of violence. One point of evidence is that NATO secret armies were, it seems, linked to the coup d'etat, the military coup d'etat in Greece in 1967. We have also data which links the secret armies to the military coup d'etat in Turkey. And some people in Italy, right-wing terrorists, uh, including Vincenzo Vinciguerra, uh, they have said, yes, we carried out uh, acts of terrorism. Yes, we had to attack women, we had to attack children, innocent people, far removed from the political game, because the idea was to scare the population, to make them fear communism, because after having carried out the terrorist attack, we uh, blamed the terrorist attack uh, on the political enemy, which at the time was, was communism. So it's so-called false flag terrorism. You carry out a terrorist attack and you blame it on your political opponent. It's something very, very evil and uh, it's very difficult to find out what really happened. And NATO to this day says they had nothing to do with it but the, the Italian right-wing terrorists, they say that they were protected by NATO um, and, you know, they, they confess that they have carried out the attacks. So it's a delicate Topic. Mr. Gonser, you say that we should not exclude the introduction of NATO agents into the ranks of terrorists, and wasn't the same service used against the terrorists? 
Well, yeah, the question really is that NATO agents, we would need names, you know, we would need names to, to really say this is an agent of NATO and he was active in this and that military secret service. Um, and we do not have such names. So um, the problem is with the NATO secret armies, we only have confirmation that they existed. We have um, confirmation that they are they prepared for a Soviet invasion. We have confirmation that in some countries like like Germany, they um, recruited former SS people, people from the very right-wing spectrum, because they wanted to make sure that they knew how to use arms and, and they wanted to make sure that they were anti-communist. So the whole Gladio story, Gladio is the name of the secret state behind army in Italy, the whole Gladio story is very, very delicate in itself. And uh, so we still do not know exactly what happened on the NATO command center. What we do know is that people like like Lemnitzer, he was the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, that's a very high-ranking NATO uh, officer, that he suggested when he was still in the Pentagon, he was suggesting that false flag terrorism should be used uh, to create a, an attack against Cuba. And so that's a different context, but we have official documents from Operation Northwoods where Lemnitzer actually suggests that a ship should be blown up uh, in Guantanamo uh, on the coast of Cuba and then, you know, the Americans should say that Fidel Castro blew up the ship but in fact it would have been the Pentagon to blow up the ship. Uh, furthermore Lemnitz suggested that terrorist attacks should be carried out in Washington and uh, in Florida and then should be blamed on Fidel Castro, whereas in reality the Pentagon would have carried out these terrorist attacks. And furthermore, uh, Lemnitz has suggested that a plane should be, you know, brought to explode above Cuba, you know, and people should be told that this is a plane with uh, young American children in it and that Fidel Castro shot it down, whereas in reality the plan was to have just an empty plane, a drone. And now this plan, Operation Northwoods, was not executed. You know, Kennedy, President Kennedy said, you can't do that, and he stopped it. But really, the thinking behind it is false flag terrorism. Uh, it is strategy of tension, and we try to find out whether, uh, in the context of Gladio, the same happened in Western Europe. And what about Iran? NATO says that the main threat to the international security comes from Iran. So can we talk about the existence of a new strategy of destabilization, but in the Middle East area? If we look at Iran, uh, the main point is that Iran has a lot of oil, uh, together with Saudi Arabia and Iraq. Um, the biggest oil reserves are, of the world are in these three countries. Um, so I do think that there has been, uh, during the last hundred years, really, you know, the first oil in in the Persian uh, Gulf area was discovered in 1908. That's, you know, 105 years ago now. That this interest to control the resources of this area is very, very traditional. It's, you know, it's long standing. And if you look at Iran in 1953, you see that at that time, the country wanted to control a larger part of its oil, um, you know, and, and that then the British Secret Service, MI6, and the American Secret Service, CIA, these two secret services were the ones who operated the Gladio NATO secret armies in Western Europe. And these two secret services uh, attacked Iran in a secret war and overthrew the government of Mossadegh because Mossadegh he was the prime minister and you know he was elected and he actually wanted to control and give the oil to the uh, Iranian population but at the time you actually had the same phenomenon of false flag terrorism you had CIA people um, who dressed up as radical uh, Muslims and threw bombs in, in into into Muslim holy cities to just you know steer up fear and stir up hatred in Iran. And today, you know, now 50 years later, we are in a situation where America has attacked Iraq in 2003 and is now saying that Iran should stop building nuclear weapons. But I'm not sure that's the whole story. Uh, it might well be that the secret operations are being carried out in Iran to destabilize the country. And it might well be that secret operations are carried out all also in Syria to destabilize the country. 
so that strategy of tension and is, is used again. Again, I'd like to explain that strategy of tension is you carry out a terrorist attack, blame it on somebody who did not do it, and then you destabilize the entire country and, and people will get very confused and they don't know actually in Syria right now. I don't know it either. Who is responsible for the last 10 terrorist attacks that we have? There is a whole mm-hmm. series of terrorist attacks and it, it really creates chaos. Well, speaking about the Middle East, um, NATO armies in the middle of last century achieved their arms also through terrorism. In some Middle Eastern countries, terrorism, unfortunately, has become an integral part of life. So, are there reasons to look for the trace of the same secret armies? I think it is important uh, to look at secret warfare in general. Secret armies existed in Western Europe during the Cold War, and what historians um, and also political scientists and also citizens and politicians today have to realize is that secret warfare is a reality. You have to remember that in 1990, when the secret armies of NATO were first discovered in Western Europe, um, the European Parliament was shocked. And they said, how can this be? I mean, you know, we shouldn't have secret armies that are not controlled by Parliament because parliamentarians didn't know that these secret armies exist. So how could they control them? And then the media didn't know that these secret armies exist. It was a huge surprise to people in media. The only people who knew that these secret armies existed were uh, military officers and um, people from, from the secret services. So the challenge today really is to look at secret warfare in general. We must find out, for instance, in the war in 2011 against Libya, we have obviously the story that it was just a war between uh, Gaddafi and, and, uh, and his own population before NATO started to bomb the country. But if you look at the data more um, critically, you see that that is not true. We did have secret forces which operated inside Libya before NATO started to bomb the country. Uh, we have data which uh, shows that the CIA and the MI6 were against, again involved as the secret services of America and Great Britain. We also have data that Qatar was involved. So you always uh, have to, to search for, for the signs of secret warfare today. And um, yes, I'm convinced that secret warfare is still exists today and it's a very great danger for, for people who are interested in peace. I'm, I'm, I'm very active in, in, in the peace movement and people who try to stop wars, who try to stop secret warfare, find it very difficult to talk about secret armies. Mr. Ganza, our last and the most important question, is there any reason to say that NATO's secret armies were not dismissed and did not stop its activities in Europe? The um, question of what NATO is doing today and whether it still has secret armies is a very delicate question. I always say that the problem with NATO is that it does not want to talk about its secret armies that it had in the Cold War. You know, I once wrote a letter to NATO uh, and asked them about more data on the secret armies and they just refused, you know, they just refused to talk about the subject. So NATO is not really transparent. It is a military organization and uh, if it doesn't want to talk about something, it just doesn't talk about it. So I think it is possible that NATO um, still today is using secret warfare um, to achieve its uh, interests. Uh, and therefore, I think we need more uh, and also more critical research on what NATO really is doing. I mean, it's always, uh, you know, saying that it's a force for peace. But we know that NATO is the biggest military organization now existing worldwide. We know that NATO is basically directed by the United States and that the Europeans are only in a secondary line of command. And therefore, it is very important to have this discussion in Europe um, about NATO's history, past, present and future.